Hello and welcome to the first video in this tutorial series on Fiveflow. My name is Philipp Holl and I'm the lead developer of Fiveflow working at the Technical University of Munich. Fiveflow is a differentiable simulation framework tailored for machine learning. It has been used for all kinds of simulations from three-dimensional fluids to quantum systems. It consists of several modules, um, but in this video we're going to focus on the Phi.math module. By the way, you can find this overview page by googling Fiveflow documentation, and then it's one of the first links. Also on this page, you will find a link to the Playground, which is a blank Google Colab notebook that allows you to run Python code in the cloud, and I'm going to use this for this demonstration. By the way, you can run everything I'm going to show on your local machine as well. So first thing we need to do is install Fiveflow. So we're just going to do this using pip. And after the installation finishes, I highly recommend that you test it. You can just do this by running the phi.verify command, and it will make sure that all the dependencies are installed, and it will also check for compatible versions of TensorFlow, PyTorch, or JAX. So here on Google Colab, you can see that all of those dependencies are already pre-installed. Okay, now we can use the math module. So we could import this directly, but I'm just going to use the convenience import from phi.flow import everything, which imports all the submodules of phi.flow. Well, if you've used NumPy before, most of these functions will sound familiar to you. So we have things like zeros, or we can sample random values like so. Now there is one major difference between phi.flow and NumPy, and that is that tensor dimensions in Fiveflow always have names and also types. We're going to see about the types in just a minute, but now let's just use batch dimensions. So let's say we want to sample 10 random values here. I'm going to add a batch dimension to this, give it a creative name, and now we have 10 random values. So you see, we get a tensor that has this dimension. The superscript B just denotes that it's a batch dimension, and it also prints the lowest and the highest value in our tensor. Okay, let's call this A, and now we can do simple computations like 2 times A, or compute the sine of A. And note that all of these operations return a new tensor that has the same dimension. Okay, now let's create a second tensor with a different dimension. Now what happens if we do A plus B? Well, we get a tensor that has both of these dimensions. And the way you can think about this is that tensors are constant along all dimensions that are not explicitly listed in their shapes. So tensor A would be constant along dimension two, and tensor B is constant along dimension one. And then Fiveflow automatically reshapes the tensors and possibly even transposes the tensors so that all the operands match. Now, one of the most important operations in tensor calculus is slicing, and this also uses dimension names in Fiveflow. So let's take the first five elements along dimension one, like so, and maybe the last element along dimension two, using this syntax. We can also create tensors from NumPy arrays. So say we have a NumPy array, we can simply call the math.tensor function. And we also have to give it the type and name of our dimension. And now we have a Fiveflow tensor. You may notice that the size of 10 is actually redundant here. So we can just pass a string for the name and it will automatically infer the size from the NumPy shape. Okay, now let's come back to the dimension types. We've used batch dimensions now and those list elements that are independent. So typically in machine learning, you would load in a batch of data and run the same algorithm over all of those data points, but these samples are completely independent. And so this is Fiveflow's primary way of vectorizing code. So there is no vmap or vectorize function like in other machine learning frameworks. Instead, to vectorize a function, you simply add an extra batch dimension to one of its arguments and then all the code that depends on this argument will automatically be vectorized by Fiveflow. 
Now there are three other kinds of dimensions. Let's start with spatial dimensions. Now these represent data that is sampled at regular intervals. So typically this would be used for grids. And they are required for all kinds of spatial operations like taking the Fourier transform or taking the spatial gradient of our grid um, and so on. So here the spatial gradient will return a vector field and so it adds an additional dimension here called gradient. Now if we had another dimension then spatial gradient would simply return a three-dimensional vector field. And this works with almost all functions in FiveFlow. So you can give them arguments with arbitrary number of spatial dimensions and they will still work in that higher dimensional space. So what this allows you to do is develop code, say, in two dimensions and later on run the same code in three dimensions or one dimension. Now there's also instance dimensions and this just lists things that live in the same space can possibly interact with each other, um, like, for example, point clouds or particles, um, like so. Okay, and finally, there are channel dimensions, and channel dimensions list properties of single objects, like grid cells, um, particles, or even pixels. So typical examples of channels would be the RGB channels of an image or the XYZ component of a vector field. Now all the operations I just showed you were actually using NumPy to perform the actual computations. So we can see this by getting the native representation of a tensor, which is going to be a NumPy MD array. PyFlow also supports TensorFlow, PyTorch, and JAX. And the easiest way to make it work with those is just to change the global import statement. So for PyTorch, we would just import phi.torch. And now I can run the same code again, and it will perform all of those computations using PyTorch tensors. For TensorFlow, it's phi.tf, which gives us eager tensors from TensorFlow. And for JAX, it's phi.jax, which will use JAX device arrays. This concludes the introduction to PyFlow's math module. For a comprehensive list of all available functions, you can simply go to the API documentation by clicking on phi.math, which lists all the functions um, with their respective documentations. In future videos, we're also going to explore computing gradients of your code, running physics simulations, and launching the interactive user interface. If you encounter any problems or find bugs, feel free to contact us directly or open a GitHub issue. In the meantime, I hope you'll enjoy working with PyFlow, and I'll see you in the next video.